Uh, so this is a, a part two of uh, chapter one introduction, and uh, yeah, here we're going to discuss uh, uh, these topics uh, that are highlighted in yellow. Uh, so uh, yeah, methods in cognitive psychology, and then current status of cognitive modeling, uh, including the uh, uh, behavioral experimentation, and then computer simulation, including artificial intelligence and the uh, cognitive neuroscience or so brain imaging. So the uh, methods in cognitive psychology. Uh, so again, like we just discussed, uh, that the uh, cognitive psychology is based on the uh, information processing paradigm, which is a uh, computer metaphor of mind. Now, that the uh, most commonly used uh, measure of the uh, uh, Cognitive experiment is a uh, response time measurement. Uh, so, it's a, a basic idea is a, uh, if two cognitive processes are different from one another, then they should take a different amount of time to complete. So, for example, uh, imagine you're participating in a uh, cognitive psych experiment. Okay, so you're sitting in front of a computer monitor. And then uh, the following stimuli are presented. And uh, your task is uh, to answer as quickly and accurately as possible. Okay? So, five plus two is what? And then next, 19 plus 27 equals. So the question is, which was easier and why? And that, uh, I assume that uh, you basically found that uh, 5 plus 2 uh, was uh, much easier than the uh, 19 plus 27, right? So that means you know, that, uh, um, it took uh, much less time to uh, answer 5 plus 2 compared to 19 plus 27, right? So that uh, yeah, these two processes are different from one another. 5 plus 2 is easy, 19 plus 27 is not that easy. And that uh, yeah, therefore it took a, a shorter time to a, a complete 5 plus 2. And uh, yeah, it took way longer to uh, answer this question, 19 plus 27. Okay? So, the, uh, that, uh, that's uh, uh, one example of a uh, reaction time measurement. Again, you know, the idea is that uh, yeah, if two processes are different from one another, then they should take different amount of time to complete. Okay. So uh, here is a, another more uh, uh, technical uh, example. At a, uh, it's called a, a Posner task, but a, uh, Michael Posner came up with this uh, task. So it's called a, a Posner task, uh, but a, a, this is a, a basically the same different letter matching task. Okay, so at a, a, there are two types of matching conditions, and at a, a, one is a, a physical match, the other is a, a name match. Now in a physical match condition, okay, oh, in all these uh, conditions, you know, uh, you will see two letters uh, side by side, okay? And that uh, in a physical match condition, you need to compare the two letters and decide if the uh, two shapes are the same or not, okay? So uh, in this case, you know, that uh, the shapes of these two letters are the same, right? But uh, in this case, you know, the shapes of these two letters are different. And then in this case, uh, again, the uh, uh, shapes of the, uh, these two letters are different. Okay? Now, so let's say a physical match condition. The other condition is called a, a name match condition. In this case, you need to compare the two stimuli, two letters again, but uh, you need to make decision based on the, uh, their pronunciations, okay? their sounds. Okay? So uh, uh, in this case, this is A, and this is also A. Right, so that, uh, um, uh, their sounds are the same. Okay, now in this case, this is A, but this is also A. One is a capital letter, uh, uppercase A, and the other is a lowercase A, but uh, they're both A's, right? 
the, the uh, pronunciations are the same. The shapes are different, but the uh, pronunciations are the same. Okay? And then, in this case, one is A, the other is B. So they are, their pronunciations are different. So, uh, the question is, you know, uh, 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 how long would it take to uh, uh, perform these conditions? So, uh, here is a, uh, a Posner task, the information processing model of the uh, Posner task. So, first of all, physical match condition, right? So, the first stage is uh, your stimulus encoding. You know, you need to encode the stimuli. And then you need to compare them. You need to compare the two letters, right? And then you need to make the decision if the two letters are the same or different. And then you need to press a, a response key, right? Now, here it says a, a STM, but a, a STM stands for short term memory, okay? Now, it, a, a, in this case, that a, a uh, the, oh, so the uh, comparison and decision are performed in your short-term memory, according to the uh, Posner task model. Okay, now uh, uh, when you compare the two letters, uh, uh, you can compare them at the feature level. Okay, uh, uh, in other words, you know, all you need to do is, you know, compare the shapes of the uh, two letters. Okay, and therefore it doesn't require any lexical access. That I uh, will uh, talk more about uh, lexical access next, but uh, lexical access here means you know that uh, you don't need uh, any um, uh, in knowledge about uh, pronunciation. Language-related information is a uh, lexical access, but uh, in this case, you know you don't need to have any knowledge about the uh, pronunciations of the two letters. Okay, so that's uh, a physical match. How about a uh, name match? Okay, so the stimulus encoding remains the same. You know, you need to see the two letters and then you need to encode them. Now, you need to compare them. Uh, however, in order to compare them, see, this is a, a name match condition. So that means you need to compare the pronunciations of the two letters, the sounds of the uh, two letters. Okay, so in order to do so, you need to retrieve the sound information from uh, your long-term memory. Okay? LTM stands for long-term memory. Okay? Uh, so it's a collection of your knowledge of the uh, letters. Okay? So uh, that process is called the lexical access. Okay? So you need to retrieve the uh, sound information from your long-term memory, and then you can compare them. Right, and then you can make a uh, decision if the sounds are the same or different. And then you can press say uh, a response key, yes or no, same or different. Okay, so in this case, in the name match condition, you know, the, uh, 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 the comparison is made at a uh, name level, so that requires say uh, lexical access. Okay, retrieval of the uh, uh, sound information from your long-term memory. Okay. So in this case, the uh, uh, lexicon is the uh, uh, vocabulary information or language related information. Okay. But uh, uh, as you can see, you know that uh, between the physical match and name match, you know uh, which is more complex. Well, that uh, uh, if you look at a uh, comparison stage, right? That uh, uh, name match requires you know lexical access. Whereas, you know, the uh, physical match condition doesn't require any lexical access, right? And therefore, the uh, physical match is simpler than the uh, name match condition, okay? And therefore, the reaction time in the physical match condition should be shorter than the uh, reaction time in the name match condition, okay? So, that's what we see here. So, uh, 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 this uh, graph shows the uh, response times, okay? So uh, on the uh, x-axis, we have the uh, conditions, physical match and name match condition, okay? On the y-axis, we have the uh, reaction time or response time in milliseconds. Now, uh, in, uh, in cognitive psychology, uh, the uh, response times are typically measured in uh, milliseconds, okay? So, 
at uh, one millisecond is the uh, one one thousand of a second okay or one thousand millisecond is a uh, one second okay so the uh, reaction time in a uh, physical match condition is a uh, 550 millisecond oh so a uh, 500 millisecond is just a uh, half a second Okay, so the reaction time in the physical match condition is 550 millisecond, right? So it's slightly longer than a half a second, right? But the reaction time in the name match condition is 62630 millisecond, okay? So it is longer than the physical match condition. Okay, so that, that uh, yeah, this difference is maybe 70 millisecond, 80 milliseconds, something like that. Yeah, I know. So I'd say a split second. However, in our brain, you know, it's, uh, yeah, um, 70, 80 milliseconds are a long time. Okay, when it comes to the uh, information processing in our brain, uh, in our brain. Okay, and that uh, yeah, this is typically significant. Okay. So the point is, you know, the response times are shorter in the physical match condition than the name match condition. Why? Oh, well, because, you know, the physical match condition is much simpler than the name match condition than we just saw. Okay. Another example is that uh, you can perform the physical match condition without any knowledge of the language, even if you don't know any uh, pronunciations or sound information, you can still perform the physical match condition. However, you cannot perform the uh, name match condition, you know, if you don't know any pronunciation or sounds. Right? So, for example, uh, so, yeah, I have these two letters. So imagine, you know, if you're sitting again in front of a computer monitor and then these two letters are presented side by side. Right? If it is a physical match condition, can you make a judgment if they are same or different? Yes, you can. They are the same characters. Right? Now, how about these two? Right? They, uh, they, uh, in the uh, physical match condition, are they same or different? Well, of course, they are different from one another. Right? And you can do so even though, they, uh, I mean, uh, they, uh, these are Japanese kanji letters. Okay, so I'm assuming that uh, you don't know any Japanese kanji letters, okay, and that uh, so, uh, but uh, in the physical match condition, you know, you can judge if these two characters are the same or different. That's easy. Now, how about uh, your name match condition then? Well, I assume, you know, if you don't know anything about the Japanese kanji characters, then they cannot perform this task in the name match condition because if you don't you simply don't know it, uh, yeah, if their pronunciations are the same or different right and the uh, by the way the answer is you know in the uh, there are the same pronunciations uh, so that, uh, yeah, in the name match condition you know you can also say they are the same okay and that uh, yeah, so uh, um, that, that this is a, an easy task for Japanese a Japanese speakers or someone who knows a, uh, a Japanese language but uh, yeah, if you don't know the uh, kanji characters then you know you simply cannot perform the uh, name match task with the uh, Japanese kanji stimuli Okay, so that that uh, uh, this example shows you know uh, uh, in order to perform a uh, name match uh, trials, you know you need to have the uh, knowledge of the uh, pronunciations. Okay. Now here's a uh, the uh, this slide shows a uh, another example of the uh, uh, response time measurement. And that, uh, 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 this is a, a subtraction method by F.C. Donders. Donders was a, a Dutch uh, psychologist. And that, uh, actually, the, uh, the subtraction method was uh, uh, developed much older than the uh, Posner task. Posner came up with the uh, Posner task in the uh, 
uh, like 1960s, but uh, yeah, Donders came up with the uh, subtraction method in the uh, mid 19th century, 1850s, 1860s, something like that. Okay, so, so yeah, this is a, a very old idea. But uh, yeah, anyway, so it's a, a subtraction method. Now the basic idea again is that uh, if two processes are different from one another, then they should take a, a different amount of time to complete. Right? And then uh, the, uh, he uh, came up with the uh, three uh, types of reaction time tasks. Okay? The first one is called a simple reaction time. Okay? In this case, the instruction is that uh, you press a button when light comes on. Okay, so uh, yeah, you see one light in front of you and then one response button in front of you. So uh, if the light comes on, then you press the button. Okay, that's uh, easy. Now the second condition is called a, a discrimination reaction time condition. Okay, in this case, you, you have a, a multiple lights in front of you. Okay, so for example, you know, light A, B, C, D, and E five lights in front of you, okay? But uh, yeah, there is only one button, okay? And that, uh, yeah, the instruction, for example, would be press the button when light B comes on, okay? So in this case, you know, you need to uh, discriminate among the uh, these lights, okay? And when light B comes on, you press the button, okay? But uh, yeah, if light C, for example, comes on, then, you know, you don't do anything, okay? Now the third condition is called a, a choice reaction time condition, and that, uh, yeah, in this case you have the uh, five lights and then five uh, response buttons. Okay, and that uh, yeah, each button co uh, corresponds to a uh, the light. So at uh, yeah, button one, when light A comes on, you need to press the uh, button two. When light B comes on, three for C, four for D, five for E. Okay, so press a corresponding button to light. Okay, so those are the three conditions. So uh, this slide shows the, uh, basically the apparatus. So in a simple reaction time task, you know, press button when the light comes on. So you have uh, this light and one button. So when, uh, when this light comes on, you press this button. The uh, second condition is the re discrimination reaction time task and that uh, yeah, so there are five lights here okay and there's one button so that, uh, yeah, you're you need to uh, press this button when light b comes on but uh, when if any other light comes on you know you're not supposed to press the button the uh, third condition is the uh, choice reaction time task and that uh, yeah, there are five lights and five buttons Okay. And that uh, yeah, they correspond to one another. So uh, 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 press button one if light A comes on. Uh, press button two if light B comes on, and so on and so forth. So uh, that, uh, yeah, this slide shows the uh, uh, the models uh, of the uh, uh, Donder subtraction method. Okay, so that, uh, yeah, there are three conditions again, right? That uh, yeah, simple reaction time, discrimination reaction time, and the choice reaction time. Okay, now these are the uh, processing stages. Okay, so again, the first stage is the uh, input encoding or stimulus encoding. The uh, second stage is the uh, discrimination. Third stage is the uh, response choice. Then the fourth stage is the motor output, right? So now, if it is a, a simple reaction time task, what would you do? You need to encode the stimulus, right? But uh, uh, no discrimination, no response choice, and when you see the stimulus, you know, you just press the response key, the response button, that's it, right? So uh, yeah, there are only these two components in the processes. Now, how about a uh, discrimination reaction time task? You encode a uh, stimuli first of all, and then you need to discriminate among them, right? Which stimulus is it? Is that A or B and so on, 
right? And so the discrimination is required in the discrimination reaction time, right? But uh, you don't need to uh, choose any response buttons. So uh, if it is a uh, light B, uh, light B, then you would press the uh, button two. Uh, how about a uh, uh, choice reaction time condition? In this case, of course, the first stage is the uh, stimulus encoding again, and then the second stage is the uh, discrimination stage. Right? You need to discriminate among the uh, stimuli. And then the third stage is the uh, response choice stage. So if the uh, uh, light A comes on, then you need to press a uh, button one and so on. And then finally, you need to execute a uh, motor output and you need to execute a uh, response, right? So as you can see, in a, a choice uh, in the a choice reaction time task, you know there are all these four components there that are involved. Okay, in the discrimination reaction time, only three out of four uh, stages. In the simple reaction time, just a, a two components. Okay. So the a simple reaction time would consist of a, a encoding and a response, right? Discrimination reaction time consists of a uh, encoding, stimulus discrimination, and response. Choice reaction time uh, consists of a uh, encoding, stimulus discrimination, response choice, and response. So that's a uh, the uh, uh, that uh, the the interesting thing about uh, Donder's idea is that you know uh, so if we subtract you know simple reaction time from a uh, discrimination reaction time, then we can isolate a uh, uh, stimulus discrimination time. Is that right? So at, uh, in the uh, discrimination time, uh, reaction time, you know, we have encoding and response stages, but the uh, encoding and response stages are also included in a simple reaction time, right? So if you subtract simple reaction time from the discrimination reaction time, you know, the encoding stages will be canceled out and then response stages will be canceled out too. And therefore, we can isolate a uh, stimulus discrimination time. Oh, and of course, you know, it, uh, uh, it, is, it is typically the case that a uh, discrimination reaction time is longer than a uh, simple reaction time. Okay. And then, of course, you know, another thing you can do is, you know, subtract a uh, discrimination reaction time from the choice reaction time. Again, you know, the choice reaction time consists of the uh, encoding discrimination response choice and response, right? Whereas the discrimination reaction time consists of the uh, encoding discrimination and response. So if you subtract the discrimination reaction time from the choice reaction time, then we can isolate the uh, response choice time. Okay, and that, uh, so that's the uh, basic idea of the uh, uh, Donders subtraction method. And that, uh, actually, the uh, Donders subtraction method was uh, so basic, but at the same time so important that uh, when the uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience, especially the uh, brain imaging techniques, um, that were developed, you know, to, uh, um, the, uh, the, the lots of cognitive psychologists uh, that were interested in the uh, uh, brain imaging techniques, including fMRI and PET scan and so on, which we will discuss in more detail later. Okay, but the uh, uh, one reason was that the uh, uh, the basic logic behind the uh, PET scan or functional magnetic resonance imaging is also cognitive subtraction, which is very similar to the uh, Donder subtraction method. So in other words, you know, the, uh, the, it was easy for cognitive psychologists to understand the basic logic behind the uh, measurements and the uh, brain imaging techniques. But uh, uh, anyway, we'll talk more about them uh, in more detail later in the, uh, chapter two. So, uh, oh, another aspect is that uh, your cognitive models are uh, stage models. That uh, 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 
the uh, so for example uh, this is an, an example of the uh, Posner task uh, the actually the uh, physical match condition but the uh, uh, first stage is a uh, encoding stage the next stage is the comparison stage and the third stage is the decision stage the fourth stage is the uh, response stage right now and that uh, in the uh, traditional cognitive psychology it was assumed that uh, these processing stages occur one after another in a serial sequential fashion okay. and that uh, well again you know that, uh, because it is a, a computer metaphor of mind you know the information processing paradigm is a computer metaphor of mind right and that uh, when uh, cognitive psychology uh, emerged in the, during the uh, 1950s and 1960s and so on you know that uh, um, that, that uh, it was basically you know the von Neumann type of the uh, computer architecture that a uh, von Neumann type of computer is has a uh, serial and sequential processing uh, mechanism and that, uh, yeah, that's why cognitive models are serial and sequential models. But uh, yeah, as we will discuss in more detail, you know, that, uh, yeah, right now in these days, you know, that, uh, yeah, there are different types of uh, models that are not serial and sequential. But uh, for now, that, uh, uh, what's important is uh, uh, to understand that uh, your cognitive, basic traditional cognitive psychological models are the uh, stage models, okay? that, uh, serial sequential stage models. Now, however, well, like we just discussed, you know, the uh, stage models have some limitations. At, uh, 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 the, so the again the serial sequential model is um, that uh, the, the, even though in the uh, traditional cognitive psychology that uh, models or serial sequential models you know that uh, uh, the brain is actually a, a parallel and distributed information processing system with uh, yeah, lots of feedback loops and uh, among many levels. Okay, so that, uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, one of the limitations of the uh, uh, cognitive models, that is the uh, serial sequential model. Another problem with the uh, stage model is the uh, linear insertion. So that, uh, yeah, the problem is that uh, yeah, there's no guarantee that uh, your processing in a uh, stage remains the same regardless of the uh, task conditions. And actually, you know, if we assume a, uh, uh, some feedback loops and so on and distributed processing, that uh, yeah, it would be more natural to assume the processing in one stage varies depending on the processing of the other stages. Okay. So, uh, for example, in the uh, Donder subtraction method, you know, the uh, processing and the uh, discrimination stage might be different between the uh, discrimination reaction time and choice reaction time tasks. And that, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, that idea is called a linear insertion, and that is another uh, limitation of the, uh, the stage models. So now uh, that uh, uh, recently, uh, because of the uh, recent development in cognitive neuroscience or brain imaging, that uh, we started looking at uh, human information processing from a slightly different perspective. Uh, that uh, yeah, so these are the basic principles of information processing in the brain. One is a, a parallel and nonlinear processing. At, uh, uh, so the uh, information processing in the brain is not uh, linear and sequential, but uh, uh, rather uh, parallel and nonlinear. Again, nonlinear means you know there are many feed forward and feedback loops, and that uh, yeah, there are some hierarchical structures also. And then uh, the other uh, principle of the uh, information processing in the brain is the uh, distributed processing or distributed representation. 
so that uh, your particular cognitive functions are performed through networks of brain regions. So that uh, your brain seems to have more uh, some modules. Uh, that means, you know, it, uh, yeah, fun uh, that is associated with the uh, so-called functional localization that uh, yeah, we will discuss in more detail in Chapter 2. But uh, yeah, some brain regions are responsible for particular cognitive functions. So, for example, the uh, occipital lobe is dedicated to visual information processing, the uh, primary sensory areas. Uh, the other primary sensory areas also, like a, a primary auditory cortex, is located in the uh, temporal lobe, but uh, yeah, that is dedicated to, a, uh, to the auditory information processing, and so on and so forth. So, in other words, you know, when it comes to a, uh, uh, sensory level information processing, and the, uh, actually the uh, motor control, okay, that uh, yeah, there are some modules there are some mapping between function and the brain region. Okay? However, when it comes to a uh, higher level cognition, such as you know, thinking and so on, you know, it, uh, yeah, there isn't any uh, really a one-to-one -one correspondence between function and the structure. Okay? And that uh, yeah, so many cognitive functions, so many higher level cognitive functions are accomplished with the uh, networks of the uh, brain. That means, you know, many uh, brain regions uh, work together to a, uh, uh, perform a, a particular higher level cognitive function. So the, uh, uh, this slide uh, shows the, uh, uh, some uh, parallel and distributed processing in the brain. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is actually based on the uh, monkey brain, macaque monkey. Okay, uh, but uh, 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 and the uh, uh, basically visual information processing. But uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, here is a uh, retina, you know, that uh, yeah, at the back of an eyeball, monkey's eyeball. Then LGN stands for the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, which we will discuss in more detail later. Okay. And the V1 means a primary visual cortex, V2 secondary visual cortex, and so on and so forth. Right? So now, that uh, one thing uh, that uh, you need to understand here is that uh, in the retina, in the retinal cells would respond to a spot of light, for example, okay, something very simple. Whereas, you know, the uh, neurons in the uh, primary visual cortex are feature detectors. So that, uh, they would respond to visual features such as lines, orientations, you know, vertical line and horizontal line, and uh, also motion and speed and so on. So they are feature detectors. Okay. And then, uh, that, uh, yeah, as the uh, information processing advance, you know, the, uh, uh, neurons would respond to a, uh, something more complex. So, for example, in the area V4, you know, that uh, neurons would respond to a, a more complex geometric patterns, you know, not just visual features, but the uh, uh, combinations of the uh, uh, visual features. Okay, more complex geometric patterns. And then, uh, that, uh, yeah, this is a uh, inferior temporal lobe, okay, but the uh, neurons in the inferior temporal lobe would respond to a uh, faces, for example. And that, uh, again, you know, we will discuss uh, the uh, inferior temporal lobe and the, uh, uh, the uh, neurons. Uh, that would respond to faces in more detail later. Okay. But uh, yeah, another thing uh, I want you guys to see here is that uh, yeah, there are so many feed forward and feedback loops and distributed processing. So starting from V1, okay, when the, when the, uh, some information is, visual information is processed in V1, right? And then uh, that uh, yeah, V1, uh, the uh, information, uh, the uh, neural signals 
will be sent to v2 first of all if you see this connection from v1 to v2 right but at the same time you know the uh, neural signals will be sent to from a uh, sent to a uh, mt from v1 you know here's another uh, arrow pointing to a uh, mt coming from v1 okay so that uh, uh, it is not again serial and sequential but uh, uh, it is a uh, parallel processing here Okay, from V1 to MT and at the same time from V1 to V2, okay, and then so on and so forth. I mean, you know, there are all kinds of uh, parallel information processing here, as you can see. Also, uh, there are not only feed forward processing, but also so many feedback loops. Okay, that, uh, that means, you know, that, uh, these arrows are mainly bi-directional. Right, so uh, here's an arrow from a uh, V1 to V2, but at the same time, you know, uh, here's the arrow pointing from a uh, V2 to V1. So that means, you know, the uh, information, neural information will be sent from V1 to V2, but at the same time, there is a feedback loop from a uh, V2 to V1. Right, and the you know, same thing about uh, between V1 and MT that the uh, neural signals will be sent from V1 to MT, but at the same time, you know, the uh, neural signals will, uh, will be sent from uh, MT to V1 as well. And that, uh, as you can see, there are so many bidirectional arrows in the brain, which suggest that there uh, are uh, so many feedback loops in the brain. So those are main uh, uh, principles of the uh, information processing in the brain. Here, this slide shows uh, another aspect of the uh, information processing in the brain. That's the uh, hierarchical nature of the uh, information processing in the brain. That, uh, yeah, this is the uh, Fuster's model. Johan King Fuster is a professor at UCLA. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, so uh, uh, the uh, this is a uh, perceptual side of information processing, and this is a uh, motor side of information processing. Okay, so uh, the, uh, on the perceptual side, you know, the, uh, well, of course, you know, there are five senses. Information processing began at the uh, five senses, right? Vision, audition, touch, taste, and olfaction. Olfaction means smell. Okay. And those are five senses. And that uh, uh, says the uh, philetic sensory, uh, that means, you know, that, uh, these five senses, uh, sensory systems separated from one another. But the uh, polysensory means the uh, integration of the uh, sensory information. So, for example, right now, you know, that uh, you're listening to my lecture and at the same time you're looking at uh, this slide, right? So that means, you know, you're trying to integrate uh, information coming from the uh, audition, that's my lecture, and vision, that's the uh, slide. Right, so the uh, integration of the uh, multiple sensory information is the uh, polysensory uh, information. And then episodic information, semantic information, you know, at, uh, so around here, you know, at, uh, you actually integrate, you know, what you're just processing right now with uh, something you uh, learned in the past that uh, uh, your knowledge you have in your memory, for example, okay? That uh, yeah, you try to combine, you know, what you're hearing right now with uh, yeah, something you learned from a uh, general psychology or brain and behavior and so on. And then the conceptual information processing at the highest level. Okay. Now, the, uh, then the information is sent to the uh, motor side, okay. and, uh, and then uh, conceptual uh, motor, and then plans and programs. That, uh, yeah, that means, you know, you need to make a how to respond, okay, and action and uh, philatic motor. Okay. So you can imagine, for example, you know, the, uh, if I ask you some questions about uh, 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 about anything, 
Okay, so for example, you know, what are the uh, basic principles in cognitive psychology or information processing in the brain, right? So yeah, you need to process information and then, you know, you need to combine your information, the uh, sensory information with the, uh, your knowledge from your memory and then understand the question. And then uh, you need to prepare, you know, your answers, okay? what should be a, a good answer and then you know you need to plan and program how to execute your answers right sometimes you know they, uh, it might be a, a button press on the computer my uh, computer keyboard or sometimes you know you might need to make a, a verbal response and so on and so forth okay. and then uh, let's say uh, another thing uh, that uh, that I like about the uh, Fuster's model is that uh, uh, as you can see in this B, you know that the uh, sensory information processing is in the uh, posterior brain, including the uh, uh, the occipital lobe and the parietal uh, temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. Okay, and that the uh, the uh, the posterior brain, uh, uh, roughly speaking, corresponds to the uh, perceptual side, whereas the uh, frontal lobe corresponds to the uh, motor side. Right. So uh, 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 this area is the uh, sensory integration area of the uh, uh, parietal lobe, okay. and that this corresponds to the uh, conceptual uh, uh, level of the uh, perceptual memory. And that uh, yeah, this is the uh, so-called prefrontal cortex, as the uh, conceptual part of the uh, motor memory. Okay, and then uh, that the uh, dark blue is the uh, phyletic sensory. So this is the uh, the uh, occipital lobe, the primary visual cortex. Forty-one Broadman's area. Forty-one is the uh, primary auditory cortex. Uh, one, two, three here is the uh, somatosensory cortex. So uh, touch, and then uh, that uh, on the motor side, you know, red is the uh, uh, the primary motor cortex. Right? Pink here is the uh, uh, supplementary motor and premotor areas, and then the white is the uh, so-called prefrontal cortex. Okay? That's the uh, uh, center for higher level cognition. Now. Uh, so the uh, current status of the uh, cognitive modeling uh, that uh, uh, in recent years, you know, the, uh, we have uh, these three fundamental approaches in cognitive psychology. One is the uh, uh, traditional behavioral experimentation, okay, and that uh, of course, you know, we conduct cognitive experiments all the time. That they, uh, they in my lab, for example, you know, we conduct behavioral experiments all the time. The other approach is a, a computer simulation or artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, that they, uh, so the uh, the original idea of a, a computer simulation is you know uh, that they, uh, researchers can write computer programs to mimic human behavior. And uh, but uh, yeah, in these days, you know, uh, yeah, the artificial intelligence has been developed. Well, actually, you know, artificial intelligence has been developing so rapidly in these days. And then the third approach is a uh, cognitive neuroscience, uh, such as a uh, uh, PET scan and fMRI. Uh, PET stands for a uh, positron emission tomography, and fMRI stands for a functional magnetic resonance imaging. But uh, yeah, we'll talk more about uh, uh, some brain imaging techniques in chapter two. Okay? And also another uh, area in cognitive neuroscience is the uh, neurological data, that uh, data from brain damaged patients. Okay? So uh, in my lecture, uh, we're going to cover these um, uh, approaches Okay, the uh, behavioral experimentation as well as the, uh, well, I, uh, I would more focus on the uh, 
uh, brain imaging techniques and neurological data. But uh, uh, we'll still discuss the, uh, some uh, computer simulation results, including artificial intelligence.